And uh, joined today, uh, as we are on every uh, Wednesday, by uh, Benedict uh, uh, Spence, who is a Conservative commentator. And I'm oh, just find out like why you weren't at the Conservatism conference in Brussels that they tried to shut down. We'll, we'll find out a bit <laughs> later in the show, I'm sure. Fascinating story, that. But there is so much to talk about. Uh, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary over in Israel, a, a statement this morning. We will come to that. But front pages of an awful lot of the newspapers today is about a um, big friend of the show, Catherine Burble Singh, known mm. as Britain's strictest head teacher. She is a head teacher of a, also one of the best schools in the country. What a surprise. Uh, the Michaela Community School, where, of course, she basically applies her values, she says British values, to the school in terms of the ethos and despite having peoples from every possible background, 50% uh, by the way being Muslim, um, she has an ethos in the school where you know, we are all British, we're all school pupils here, you, your identity, whatever your religion or your race is not interesting, it's not relevant, mm -hmm. we are about what unites us, not what divides us, which is one of the reasons why she fought against a pupil who wanted to have a Muslim prayer, prayer ritual uh, during uh, certain religious times. Um, this was banned by the school on the basis that it was dividing pupils, causing intimidation of a number of other pupils, particularly other Muslim pupils during Ramadan. One pupil gave up going to choir, having been told, oh, well, this isn't you know, a thing you should be doing during Ramadan and things like that. Um, it's gone to court. It, extraordinarily, the mother of the pupil managed to get legal aid, tens of thousands of pounds worth of legal aid, uh, to take this matter to the High Court. Thankfully, yesterday, the High Court saw sense. It is a victory for common sense. Um, and uh, basically ruled in favour of the school and their right to ban Muslim prayer rituals in the playground, except to their fact that they don't have a spare room they can turn into a prayer room, and that actually the ethos of the school is very simple. And as Catherine Burble Singh said, pretty much in a, in a statement, you know, if you don't like the values of the school, if you don't like the rules of the school, you can send your child to a different school. Mm. She's right, isn't she, Benedict? She is. I mean, we're not short in, in this country on schools that have a lot of provisions for <laughs> parents and pupils who uh, have religious beliefs and want to adhere to that uh, up and to and in over the point at which it might impact on their studies. I think that's the big thing about this, is that the proof is in the pudding with this school. The results are exemplary. People come from all sorts of uh, all sorts of backgrounds. Parent, Many parent, of them are. Parents don't speak English. Yep. They're living on housing estates. They're, you know, council estates, they are, they are free school income. meals. Yep. They, you know, these are, these are children who the rest of the education establishment has said, well, of course we expect these children to fail. Mm. What can you do? Mm. Poverty of low expectations. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Burble Singh said, uh, no, these kids can all be achieving top grades. And what a surprise, they do. They do. And I think that one doesn't want to sort of second guess the motives as to why this case was brought. Don't but, we? Well, this, <laughs> I'm going to now. It, it's <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely. It's, it, it's one of those things where you do just have to think, is it an, an attempt to sort of, you know, a, a impose a, a way of thinking or a system on other people? Is it a way simply to be a bit different? We know a lot of children often just try to be rebellious for the sake of being rebellious. Yeah, but they don't normally get their parents to get legal aid to, to do that. I mean, they you know, don't, I wanted but... to wear my tie a bit mm. differently from the school rules at my comp. But you know what? You just got put in detention. But, End of story. But in some ways, quite ambitious children might be applauded for taking it that far, for having the, the, the imagination to think, how can I really twist the knife? How can I really get attention? I could go this far. Do you know Either what my way, response is? I know what your response is going go to be. Go to your room. Yeah. <laughs> go to your room. <laughs> go to your room, come out when you could be nice. <laughs> that wasn't the response of the parent, though. The parents seemed to agree with the child. But the most extraordinary <laughs> thing about this, not only did the parent mm. back this, and again, and, and, and this case sort of went all the way to court after Catherine Burble Singh said, right, no, there'll be no prayer rituals in mm. the playground. Again, up to 30 children praying very openly in the playground. Um, you know, they hadn't done it before. They were absolutely fine without it before. Their parents yeah. signed up to a school. They, she told them what the rules were, what the ethos was. And, and, uh, and, and then when she banned that, we then saw, you know, bricks through uh, teachers' windows, a black teacher who was racially abused. We mm. saw intimidation of other pupils. Clearly unacceptable. Clearly, uh, you know, again, this is, this is not about your, your, right, you know, your, your right to be religious. Well, no, you've, you've chosen not to send your child to a faith school. Mm. You've, I mean, you've literally, you had that choice. I mean, I'm an atheist, right? I had no state schools near me that were not religious. Yeah. Not one. All but one of the state schools near me, when I was looking at primary schools for my daughter, required you to have gone to church, basically, since before you'd even thought about having a baby, long mm. before they were actually born. You get a downside more choice if, you're, if you have faith in this country. So, you know, you've chosen a non-faith school, and then, you know, then stick with it. But the most extraordinary thing is the, the mother and the, the, the child have said, there are other things they might want to take legal action over. I mean, yeah, no you know, if you're that unhappy, move schools. Mm. Um, but also, the, the, the mother has applied for her, the, 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 the pupil's younger sibling mm. 
to go to the school in the autumn. Yeah, because I mean, they recognise extraordinary. Because they recognise that it's a very good school and that its techniques actually work. But I think you know again. Yeah, one of the things I think we have to praise about uh, Catherine Burwell-Singh's approach Among is... Among the million things. Yeah, yeah. ...is that she's steadfast on this, that she recognises that bringing in special dispensations for different groups causes division. That's, you know, literally the opposite of harmony. That literally yeah. stops what the whole point of the school is about. You can't sort of give in to this. And, you know, if it's this particular group... And that's because, yeah. of, you know, the thing... Not just talking about Muslims in general here, praying. No, it's not. One particular strain of Islam, and then the next one, then the next, and then the Catholics, and then the Protestants. Mm. You know, where does it end? You have to find special spaces for all of them? Yeah. Do they have to share? And it's a very Will they be fighting school. over time? Yeah, they no, have no spare rooms at all. Yeah. They have tiny little rooms. It's an indulgence, is what this is. It is, and as she's saying again, it's you know, so much about diversity politics, she said in a very lengthy statement, uh, as, is about dividing people and finding all the reasons why we're different, as opposed to, this is what we're united by, these are our values, this is what we believe in, this is what we do, it's one of the reasons why we have kids wearing school uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to hear from you, I'd love to hear from you, you've heard what Benedict and I think, uh, Britain's strictest hit teacher, Catherine Bubble Singh, has won her high court battle against a Muslim people who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. Just let me want to know, what is your reaction? You know, do you support her? Do you support the pupil? Do you think there's, you know, you sitting on the fence on this one? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can give us a call. 0344 499 You can also send a WhatsApp on the same number. You can text us on 87222, uh, or you can uh, send us a message on x at talk TV. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Let's also talk about the, um, the vote in the House of Commons last night. There was one in the House of Laws on Rwanda, vote in the House of Commons on the, uh, the, the smoking ban announced mm. by Rishi Sunak, a big announcement in October Tory party conference. And I think most of us were pretty surprised. This, this is the thing you're going to do to change the country. Mm. And that was bringing in a smoking ban. Anyone born from the 1st of January 2009 onwards, so 15 roughly now, um, you're never going to be legally allowed to buy cigarettes. Now, mm. we talked about this on the show a lot yesterday. Um, I've written a piece for The Sun today. And again, I'm, you won't find a more avid anti-smoker than me yeah can't can't bear smoking i think it's insane i genuinely think it's insane to smoke it's such a no-brainer in terms of your health um and, and we've got vaping as an alternative they go vape it's not it's not perfectly safe but it's a lot safer um i'd love it if no one smoked in this country if my daughter smoked i've got to be honest with you the reaction would be probably illegal from me not telling not telling a lie there but um talk of a smoke of, of a smacking ban today as well um but um at the end of the day, I don't think this is how you change people's smoking habits. And I don't think you can bring in a law I, where mm. one adult can go in and buy cigarettes and another adult a day younger than them can't. It's absurd. I mean, that is a particular nonsense, that idea that you're going to have this sort of divide and it moves up slowly every year, as if people won't find a very easy way around that. And as if the police are actually going to enforce that in a time when they don't really, you know, enforce all sorts of rules. When it comes to actually illegal drugs and things like that, you, we often find that they just don't respond. What, they're going to go to every sort of corner shop and check, you know, every time a, you know, a shop owner says, oh, this person is underage. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's, it's a nonsense, yeah. it's posturing, it's making it look as if they're doing something when in fact they aren't but also it is i'm afraid very I illiberal very draconian yeah. it's un as well as being unnecessary it's the first step if you like because i think a lot of people will you know a lot of people will just go cigarettes are bad like you yeah. and therefore a lot of people will actually unlike you say i haven't got a problem with a cigarette ban I'm, but where I'm, then does I it end? the indoor ban because that had an impact on other people mm. whether you were working in a bar as i'd done or whether you were sitting in an office i mm. sit surrounded genuinely in all sides by mm. chain smokers at six o'clock in the morning but what next is the thing because exactly. once this has happened and once they feel that they can bring this in i'm telling you it's going to happen for alcohol at some point in this country. Sugar. A lot of people say, oh, it'll never happen, it's too deeply ingrained in our culture. Smoking was very deeply ingrained in our culture. Mm. Lots of people yeah. smoked, they thought it was healthy. They and the same people, the same sort of do-gooders and, and, yeah. and you know, public health uh, finger-waggers, they, um, they're the people who say that even one glass of wine a day is mm. bad for you. No, it's not. There's no evidence for this statement whatsoever. Mm. Um, it, it, I mean, it is just ridiculous. My thing is, you know, it's, I, I was very nanny state in, in, in my younger years that sort of, well, you know, I don't like it and I don't do it, so let's ban it. And then you realise, oh, well, no, what if they come for something of mine? So maybe if it's not imposed on me, imposed mm. on me, so I'm not sitting next to someone in a restaurant who's, you know, you know people used to hold their cigarettes like, like this, sort of <laughs> behind, they used to hold them like behind them. Oh, I'm glad mm. you're not getting the smoke, but I do. Mm. And I, genuinely, it was unpleasant, it was smelly, it was bad for other people's health. But, but if someone wants to smoke in their own home or smoke outside, it's none of my damn business what they want to do with their health. Mm. And, and if we are saying it's, oh, it's the impact on the NHS, 
um, you know it's a very slippery slope because you're going to start stop banning people from being obese. It's not a good idea to be obese, mm. but I think people have the right to be obese if they want to. I mean, nowadays being obese is worse for you on average or worse for the NHS than smoking is. Yeah. You know, it causes a lot more illness, a lot more cancers, yeah. a lot more suffering. So you're right. At what point? And then what's the next thing? You know, poor sleep quality kills an awful lot of people. They're going to give us mandated bedtimes. You know, it's the sort I, of thing where think, you wouldn't be I, surprised. I <laughs> don't think they would have. They would stop that. The funny thing about these people who are really, really big on all these rules and finger wagging mm. adults. They're remarkably bad at parenting, these people. Yes. They're all sort of those liberal parents who don't think children should have rules. No. I've, I've nef definitely noticed the people who are most in favour of, of curbs on what adults can do are bloody useless parents whose mm. children are absolutely foul and, and are the sort of people that you sort of snarl at in restaurants. Well, if you're me. <laughs> If you're me, you just trip them up you, when they run say, past you your snarl, table. Snarl that's just of children. me. <laughs> People think I'm joking when I say that. No, I literally do that. Uh, anyway, what do you think, though, in terms of the politics of this? Because it was a free vote, so mm. technically speaking, you know, you, you're allowed to vote against the government. We saw Kemi Bejanok, the only cabinet minister, but none of the other ministers voted against this. Mm. Um, uh, we had 59 Tory MPs in total vote against the message. 106 abstained, I have to say, which is pretty poor. So, you know, if you agree with it, vote for it. If yeah. you don't agree with it, vote against it. The abstaining is very plur. Yes. But it went through with Labour votes. Um, <laughs> but pretty much half the Conservative Party didn't back the Prime Minister. Is this, I mean, again, a lot of those are leadership hopefuls. Mm. Is this quite a statement about where, how he stands I, I, with, among his party? I think so, and I think it's also sort the of drawing, drawing sort away. of battle lines, actually, for the post-British Sunak era. You've got people like yeah. Kemi Bainock actually sort of standing there going, no, actually, this is not something that I agree with. And Conservative members will notice that because, let's be clear, we don't expect Rishi Sunak to be leader of the Conservative Party when he loses the election. So there's going to be a lot of people jumping on that opportunity. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will accept that this is posturing, but it's also the sort of posturing that a lot of them want to see, having been yeah. let down for so long by Indeed. a series of Conservative prime ministers. More posturing also by the uh, peers in the House of Lords, although that, you know, with mm. the Rwanda bill, that is expected to become law by Friday. But mm. um, uh, you mentioned sort of leadership hopefuls. Well, an awful lot of them, by the way, were over in Brussels yesterday for a conference, uh, the National Conservatism Conference. Um, it was uh, held in the Belgian capital. It was already on its third venue. Mm. Uh, the uh, socialist mayor of Brussels having basically put pressure on venues to uh, to to close down uh, and and cancel the conference they managed to get it ahead um and it was i mean it's just extraordinary nigel farage was on stage um the president of the reform uk party when police came to try and shut it down three police officers came uh, they decided quite wisely they weren't going to try and cart him off the stage he carried on it ended up with a standoff with dozens and dozens and dozens of armed sort of shielded police officers outside refusing to allow anyone in including some guest speakers mm. and refusing to allow anyone out so people were stuck there but also and refusing to allow the catering company in to this hotel so uh or well, this venue so um people have you know if you want to stay you've got no food for the day if you leave you can't come back but um we're told you know unsavory characters there was a risk of there being some sort of physical violence mm. uh i mean Surely, if there's physical violence, I mean, why don't you tackle the people committing the physical violence rather than a completely legitimate conference? But you've even heard you know, Politico refer to this as a hard right conference. Mm. Um, Kay Burley this morning on Sky News, which I made the mistake of watching, talked about the unsavoury characters mm. sharing the platform. Um, we talk about so Nigel Farage, who won like you know, basically one of the key you know figures of, of British politics. Suella Bradman, former Home Secretary. Mm. Um, Miriam Cates, leading uh, Tory MP, um, and right on an awful lot of things, I have to say. Um, uh, we we had, um, uh, I mean, um, well, I mean who, else, who else was there? Um, uh, Liz Truss was, is due mm. to be there. Um, the former Mac, Prime Minister yeah. Viktor Orbán, the Hungarian Prime Minister. Now, may not like him, may not agree with his politics. Mm democratically elected a figure. An awful lot of the leaders of parties, who Nigel Farage pointed out, are likely to win the European elections in June mm. across many countries. And his socialist mayor sh tried to shut this conference down. It wasn't just politicians. There were academics there as well, people like Matt Goodwin, lots yeah. of people actually who are fairly, I'd say, well-known household names, certainly within conservative mm. politics, not actual fringe lunatics. I mean, the first thing that I was very curious about was why it was being held in Brussels, because Brussels is not famously a particularly tolerant place, um, especially for politicians who don't like the idea of Brussels. Um, it's it's you know, really an easy place for a lot of people to get to. You'd think so, but I don't think London is exactly hard to travel to. It is an international hub, but that's beside the point. It is a deeply illiberal thing to see. 
Um, but again, it, it's one of those things that you shouldn't really be surprised about because, as you say, there are people referring to it as hard right and sort of dismissing it out of hand. Well, once people feel that they can do that, and you see it a lot actually with you know, relatively normal conservative groups, you know, we, we had this with the five families, but you know, mm. supposedly getting progressively more and more right wing, but actually they're fairly standard, a lot of them. It's just easy, therefore, to dismiss, and people shrug and they go, oh, well, I don't like the far right, I yeah. don't like the hard right, this must be a good thing. And it's only sort of after the fact, after the police have turned up, after it's been broken up, that people go, Oh, hang on a second. I quite like that person. Why was, yeah. why, why was he cast off? But stage? either way, I don't care whether... I mean, genuinely, I, d I don't even want, you know, a, a, a BMP camp, uh, conference broken up. And I absolutely abhor everything that they think. I think they are an openly, blatantly horrible mm. racist party. But you always fight bad ideas with good ideas, with debate, with facts, with your morality. You don't need to shut down people mm. who are spouting nonsense and hate. Mm. You defeat them with your words, with your ideas and your campaigns. But of course we have to remember the mayor of Brussels is a socialist. And that who, in, by that the way, has happily a... invited properly, properly far-right figures mm. to, 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 to uh, meetings. Again, again, bearing in mind that people think I'm far-right. I mean, for God's, I mean, for God's sake. That's because you goose step into work. Okay, yes. obviously. Yeah. Okay. But, it, but, it is, but it's, not, it's laughable, though, these, these terms, hard right, mm. far right, and what they mean, you know. But they never use some, like, far left about a lot of uh, people who are blatantly far left. And by the way, Labour Party, some mm. in the Labour Party being, you know, oh, well, oh, these people, you know, show, you know, platforms with some very dodgy uh, yeah. people with strong extreme opinions. You try to get Jeremy Corbyn mm. elected as Prime Minister of this country, you know, Shut it. You do not have a leg to stand on. Again, it's that sort of sympathy that comes from, I think a lot of people, certainly in the media in this country, are centre-left. You'd say sort of soft-left, yeah. I think, of them. And they wouldn't necessarily ver verbalise that, but they are. And it's that sort of, OK, well, we don't like people like Jeremy Corbyn necessarily, but he's better than a centre-conservative. Yeah. So we'll tolerate it. And yeah. it's the same. These people are hard right. Actual socialists, well, they're just on the left. Yeah, they're not indeed. hard anything. Indeed. Um, look, um, David Cameron, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary, is over in Israel. Uh, he has uh, made a statement this morning saying you know he wants you know he, he wants there to be uh, a sort of uh, he's saying it's right to have shown solidarity with Israel he says we hope that uh, when they make their decision to act regarding the Iran attack at the weekend we hope they do so in a way that does as little as to escalate this as possible mm. and in a way that he said as I said yesterday is smart as well as tough uh, the real need is to refocus back on Hamas he says and he also uh, talked about coordinated sanctions against Iran uh, certainly we need to re reinstigate those mm. um, do you think that Israel will be listening I, I suspect they probably will because actually it's not in Israel's interest to prompt an existential war with Iran in the same way that it's not in There'll Iran's There'll be a interest. response but it'll be small scale. I suspect so because Netanyahu again he can't be seen, much like the Iranians, they can't be seen to not be doing anything but yes I suspect there will be an attack on a military target, probably yeah. one that's not particularly valuable. Which would be completely legitimate. Completely legitimate given actually what went before. But I think what is significant is it's an altering in the situation in that now both sides are prepared to directly target each yeah. other. There's no more of this, oh well we're going to hit a consulate and we're going to hit some civilians and we're going to do this, that and yeah. the other and we're going to get our proxies to steal a ship, any of that. It's now, okay, you fired a missile right at us, we can fire one back at you. Might not be a lot, might be very deliberately aimed at you know, a, a pointless ammo dump yeah. or something like that, but that dynamic has changed and that is very yeah, concerning. Absolutely. Uh, let's get to the most important story of the day. Mm. Uh, the revelation that uh, Meghan, uh, the Duchess of Sussex, mm -hmm. is uh, going to launch a new jam. I know, it's what we've all been waiting for, everybody. She's got this new lifestyle brand. It's such... I genuinely think... Uh, uh, genuinely, I think mm. they, they just... They, they went through a dictionary and went... Um, this, <laughs> this page got the word American. This page, Riviera. This, Orchard. Yeah, American Riviera Orchard. That's a good name for a lifestyle brand. I mean, it, no, it's not. It's terrible. But their first, the first launch is going to be a batch of strawberry jam, and uh, the reviews already gushing. Oh, wonderful! I mean, have uh, been said, "Hi, Megan, where's my jam? Love strawberry jam." What? what? Bearing in mind, though, mm. wouldn't it be allowed to be advertised on uh, the tube under Sadiq Khan? No, it's, it's drunk food. Because it's processed. basically sugar. Mm, I mean, it's basically you. sugar. That's what jam is. It's not. It's not strawberries. It's sugar. <laughs> Yeah, the Sussexes are trying to kill people. Oh, there's a headline for you. No, I mean, I've, I've needed a, an alternative to Tip Tree and Bon Maman for a while. I, I definitely will try this out. I wonder what they're going to call it. Sticky situation? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But strawberry, I think they could have come up with something a little bit more exciting I mean, than you that. you think, like, I don't know, fig and something. They're Hollywood celebrities. Avocado and lychee. Yeah. Something exciting. Strawberry jam. Is that the best you've got, <laughs> Megan? Anyway, we, we shall see. Anyway, obviously, it's the biggest story of the day, so I'm all, I want you to get in touch about that. No, I do not want you to get in touch about that. <laughs> 
for the love of God, do not get in touch about Megan and Jan because I will ban you from listening forever and ever and ever.